Thank you very much. Uh, it's not normal to begin a lecture on uh, a reader. I mean, but there's a reason for that, as you will see today. Uh, so the, I want to post to you a very simple reader, and I will tell you the answer, of course, at the end. And you will see the reason why this is important for this lecture. So here is the, the reader is a bit expressed technically. Uh, you have a, a box, and I'll tell you what's inside later on. There is a battery. And uh, when you connect a battery, say a time zero, and with some initial, this is the current, and with uh, any initial current, uh, say I zero, you will observe, put this in the oscilloscope, you find out that it will send it to a DC steady state, which is equal half, one of half of that minus the half of that value. And so this is, of course, not very, uh, uh, this very common. You expect things to go, this is DC. But what's interesting is uh, you now add a 4 ohm resistor. And 4 ohm resistor is something all of you know is dissipates heat. If anything, it will make this circuit uh, generate more heat and more stable. Uh, but the surprising thing is when you do that, the same initial condition also gives you a waveform that after you go to infinity, it blows up, which is quite unusual. And so the reader is for you to find out what do you think inside has this property. And in fact, uh, just to give you uh, a hint, I will tell you that this, this circuit inside actually is very simple. And in fact, it has only two circuit elements, only two. And not only two, I'll tell you what they are. It has a linear resistor of certain ohms, R ohm, and an inductor of certain L. That's all. One resistor, one inductor. And, but if you choose the value properly, this is what will happen. And later on, we'll come back to this because the reason why this strange behavior happened is precisely because of the edge of chaos. So this is the reason. Okay, now uh, let me begin by telling tell you a little bit of an outline of what I want to do. Uh, since this uh, conference is about complexity and chaos, I'm going to try to relate the two to you, and I will, the main message that you are going to get at the end is the edge of chaos is in fact the hidden route to complexity. Uh, all the most of you probably have never heard of this before because this is a very new result. Okay, now let me begin by telling you, uh, I would uh, imagine that most of you do not really know what is complexity mean. And I really mean that because I, uh, uh, because I didn't know what it means some years ago until uh, I had to find out how to make sense out of this. But I will tell you, we will begin with what is not complexity, that you will understand. So this is a simple picture here uh, of a room, this room. And imagine that uh, someone there at the corner start to brew uh, a cup of espresso coffee. You know what? Five to ten minutes, the last person at the very last end corner is going to smell coffee. That I will guarantee that will happen. And that's because the molecule will distribute and eventually the whole room is going to be full of coffee molecules, even homogeneously distributed. This is what the second law of thermodynamics tells us. Entropy. So we start with something we are all familiar. Entropy guarantees, the increase in entropy guarantees we will have everything homogeneous. And the same thing of course happens if you have a cup of coffee and you pour some milk in there. 
And in about five minutes, even if you didn't steal it, it would be all white is uniform. And that's again not complexity because complexity means not uniform, whereas this is uniform. And one more example will convince all of you what is not complexity. And this is from Lord Kirvin that most of you of course know. Uh, and this is copied from Lord Kirvin many years ago. He said, suppose that you could block the molecules in the glass of water, then pour the contents of the glass into the ocean, not only the Mediterranean, but all the oceans, and still the land will follow so as to distribute the mark molecule. Let's say all the molecules become red color. Okay? And you distribute over all seven seas including the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. If then after that you took a glass of water anywhere out of the ocean, you would find it to have about a hundred of your red molecules. So again, this is a classic example of second of the water. Everything becomes homogeneous after a while. That is not complexity, because when everything is the same, there is no complexity. But there are many other examples of systems made up of identical molecules or identical cells in a coffee these are identical coffee molecules uh, and but under the certain condition the result is not homogeneous it has a pattern or structure so this is the simplest example imagine you have a round disc and you fill with let's say a one centimeter of water and then you hit underneath uniformly, under the right heating, you will see that the water which originally is of course are all homogeneous, begin to form hexagon, hexagonal patterns. So there is now pattern, and pattern of course is information. And this is very interesting. How does this pattern come from? And this is the beginning of what people call complexity. There are probably about 50 or up to 100 books uh, over the last 50 years where they also talk about many examples, including this one. And but uh, he said hexagonal pattern is all over, not just not just that uh, experiment. For example, uh, you may not realize, but if you uh, look at your eyes, cornea under a microscope, they are very small, and you see these are made of hexagonal patterns. Even though individually you look at the cells, all the cells are identical, and yet why should there be a hexagonal pattern? And you can get it larger in scale. These are, most of you recognize uh, what you had breakfast. These are honeycombs. Honeycombs are hexagons. And then you can increase in scale. Go to <coughs> Nepal, and you see under the right sunshine condition, great expanses of land have these hexagonal patterns. So this is one example that there are many situations that arises that all have similar hexagonal patterns. They have absolutely nothing to do with each other. The water and the sand is absolutely unrelated about the cornea, and yet we have hexagonal pattern. There must be a reason for that. But hexagonal pattern is not the only pattern. Let me show you uh, these are uh, stripes. This is, uh, I'm sure, uh, in the agency out there, you are going to see a lot of these beautiful striped fish. Uh, but not only fish has stripes, there is a uh, species of frogs whose skins are uh, who form stripes. And yet, if you look under the microscope, Every cell is identical. Either it's cell under the strap or outside the strap. You cannot distinguish them. So why should there be stripes? And of course, uh, all of you are familiar with uh, this animal is made full of stripes. I would mention that this strap here are vertical, but also look at the tail. You may not realize. You go to the zoo next time. You will see that this they are. Stripes, but they are horizontal. 
Why is that? Again, all the cells are identical. And of course, all of you want to see zebras. They, they have full of their full of stripes. All this is a caterpillar uh, stage, it's called a worm, and it's stripes. So we have from hexagonal pattern to stripes, and now to spots. These are now uh, animals with spots. There is a species of frogs that are whose skins are formed of spots. And in fact, uh, just uh, last year there was a paper in Nature which said, showed that uh, about 100,000 years ago, there is a species of horse that we of course are extinct today, but they are the skin of the horse are spots. And yet again, the cells under the microscope are all identical. There are also species like the zebrafish uh, that has both spots and stripes like that. So now we go from hexagon to a stripe to spots to combination of them. These are all patterns. So these are all under the context of complexity. And then of course all of you know about snowflakes. These are dendrites. And this is a form of water molecules, but you can form similar kind of thing. Uh, this is a shallow dish and with a coat with oil, and then you, if you imagine that you have a pipe here and you pump water under high pressure, because of the symmetry, our intuition suggests that you should have a uniform white water. And yet you don't, you see a pattern. These are Dendrites. Here is another pattern that are also dendrites, and yet this is totally unrelated uh, to what I have just shown you. In fact, this is just a satellite view of the uh, the delta of the Colorado River in uh, the Gulf of California. So they are dendrites as well. Again, they are totally unrelated, but they are very familiar patterns. So, the reason I'm showing you all this is because they are patterns in all aspects of life and nature. And because of that, there are many books written. And many of these examples I've shown you are, you can find in these different books. But I will show you only a few books because these are books written by famous authors. Uh, most of you of course know Prigogini, and it's called Exploring Complexity. And there is uh, Robert Rowling, and there is a uh, Gelman, Maureen Gelman, most of you know, of course, uh, got his Nobel Prize for Quarks. And again, you can see here, from about uh, adventure in the simple and the complex. The point I'm telling you here, here is that the word complexity is used everywhere, it, not only here, and then another Nobel winner, a uh, Eigen, in chemistry, steps forward life. This was just four of them, but there are more that you all of you know Schrodinger. In his book, uh, What is Life? He also talks about this question of complexity. And so it's this famous book by Kaufman. He talks about self-organization and complexity. And then another book for self-organizing system. Another series famous book of signal genetics. Most of you know Herman Hacken. Uh, and he has about 100 volumes of books now and they're called Synergetics. And if you look at all of these books, you will see that many of these examples are in the books. And in fact, um, in all of, most of these books, you will see these words like complexity, cooperative phenomena, dissipated structure, edge of chaos, which is the title for today, and which is used in a different meaning today because as you will see, uh, people who use this word before well, uh, not really doing it scientifically. There's emergent phenomena, far from equilibrium phenomena or non-equilibrium phenomena, 
order from disorder, phase transition, self organization, synergetics. Now, for most people, including myself, many years ago, I was really intimidated by so much new things. Because I didn't know any of this before. I said, my God, I have to spend another uh, 50 years just to learn what this is. Because uh, specialists were all written by famous authors, like you have seen. So there must be something very good in there. And so I begin to ask, after looking at all these uh, examples, I ask the question, what do all these names have in common? Do I have to spend 25 years to learn every one of them that like a new subject? And I was shocked to find out that they have only one thing in common. All of these things I share you. And that is, they have no definitions. That is the problem. People talk about complexity, about emergence, about all of those things. But they don't really know what they mean. And the reason they don't know what they mean is because they do not even have a definition. Just to give you an example, more regular man that uh, most of you know. Uh, this is just one page from his famous book. I have underlined a few words. You can see self-organized, uh, emergence, complex structure, emerge, self-organized, complexity, etc. So he has used these three words uh, three times, uh, uh, or two or three times in this one paragraph. And in fact, if you look through Berman's entire book uh, on complexity, you will see that he had used all of these words that I have listed here many, many times, interchangeably, meaning the same thing without a definition. I call this the art of pathology, which means that you use an undefined term to define another undefined term. And in fact, if you now realize this, I will now tell you that just the, all of this world are equivalent. I call them jargon because jargon means there's no definition, just names. They are all equivalent, they all mean the same thing. Complexity, emergence, self-organization, synergetics, non-equilibrium, collective behavior. They turn out that they all mean the same thing. Now, I'm not trying to say that the authors try to be different. The reason is all of, most of these authors are different have, from different disciplines, some from chemistry, some from biology, some from economics, some from physics. And so when they see something interesting, they write a book and they don't have a name, so they invent their own names. So, so, so it is uh, an honest effort to try to explain something new without realizing that what they are describing have, are not properly described because they have no definition. And here's a, a one last slide to show you that uh, seven words are all mean the same thing. Uh, emergent, synergetic, self-generated, self-assembled, spontaneous, endogenous, autochronous, autopoietic, autocatechinetic. So these words are pretty in intimidating and uh, for the uninitiated, this is uh, very confusing. And I will tell you, these are all, they mean the same thing. They are all jargons. They are all examples. They have no theory. Even Hawking, Stephen Hawking said, I think the next century was asked in the year 2000, the new century. Uh, what do you think is the next century? He said, I think the next century will be the century of complexity. And even Hawking doesn't know what complexity means. Even though it tweeted them because they all had a feeling what it is, but no one had a precise uh, understanding. So complexity, which is the title of this conference, is in fact currently a very hard, multidisciplinary, uh, multidisciplinary without a foundation. And of course, after uh, criticizing all of these uh, authors, I have to be prepared to tell you that I have a definition. And, and in fact, I have 
Because without a definition, you cannot be scientific. You cannot prove any theory. And I'm going to prove, give you some theory. I'm not going to prove that. But we must have first a definition. So my definition is very simple. What is complexity? A homogeneous media, like, like a media made of all cells, that are every, everything in the middle is not identical. Okay? A homogeneous media is said to be to exhibit complexity if and only if it admits a non-homogeneous spatial temporal solution. So it, it says that if you have a collection of identical cells, which by all rights is an identical solution, and if you do not find identical solution, if you have a pattern, then we say we have complexity. So it's, it's a very simple definition that everyone can understand. So, so you either have uniformity or you have something that is not uniform. And in fact, my theory will tell you that all you need is two different points that are different and you have complexity. And the reason is I can prove that if you can have two different points, different uh, solutions or different color, then every other point will all be different as well. So, so complexity really means in a very simple case, either you have only one solution or you have more than one. That, that is actually the fascinating part about it. But the mathematics of that is very complex and I will just tell you the main result later today. So to summarize, first of all, all of these examples I show are, you can say, homogeneously distributed. They, they are infinitesimally small cells are very small. But it doesn't have to be small, it could be discretized. So we also define complexity as the spontaneous emergence of patterns or structures could be two dimension, between dimension, or even in dimension. Or the homogeneous array or collection of identical cells which interact with neighbors via simple local rules. So typically this is so exciting because the cells, if, they, if you take only one cell, you can see it's nothing. It's incapable of doing anything interesting. But if you put many of them together and you let them interact, but you let them interact in a very simple way, because if you let them interact in a complicated way, then of course, something interesting will happen. The point here of complexity is you make them interact in a most trivial way, and then something happens. That's what is uh, interesting and, and why it is an important subject. So, conversely, we can say no complexity means no multiple solution. So the science complexity boils out to developing a mathematical theory of whether you have one solution or more than one solution. When you put many identical cells together and couple them in a very simple way. Okay, now let me uh, look at some specific quotations. This is from Schrodinger, that all of you know, in this uh, very beautiful book, What is Life? published in 1944. Schrodinger uh, says, how does the living organism avoid decay? That means, why, why did uh, we uh, have to follow the route of the entropy increase? Uh, where is the second law of the environment? And Schrodinger says, by eating, drinking, breathing. The technical term is metabolism, which is a Greek word that means change. And so it says the exchange change for what? Freud didn't know what, but he has a very deep feeling that it is something deep. He didn't know what it is, so he did invent a name. He called that negative entropy. And you will see later today, and negative entropy is exactly is of chaos. So that, but the astrologer had no way to know that. Now for a homogeneous media to exhibit non-homogeneous pattern or structure, the homogeneous solution must become unstable. Because there is always one solution. If you have a collection of identical things, then of course one solution is that they all have identical solution. That's one solution. Okay? So the only way you can have Another solution is for that obvious one, the common solution, to become unstable. And so that is obvious that that has to happen. And so 
But that's only an observation. It's not the real theory. But Prigogini, another uh, famous Nobel Prize winner from chemistry, uh, sort of realized that. So he said biological order. Like Sorensen, he said he's looking at biology. Manifest is served by a series of structures of growing complexity. So he's using the word complexity like many others without knowing what it means. Okay. This is contrary to the thermodynamics of isolated system, which leads simply to the state of not stable disorder. So Fritz Frigogenes asks, should we then introduce some new principle of nature, such as the instability of the homogeneous? So like Sorensen, he is deeply in, uh, believe that there is some principle, but he doesn't know what. So we say, call it, he will call it the instability of the homogeneous. And you will see today that that instability of homogeneous is actual chaos. So that is the connection for my talk here. Now, many famous scientists, including Strodinger and Prigogine Moray, all striving to try to understand what is complexity. So they, even though they don't have a definition, they all realize that you need something uh, important to have this phenomenon. So Strodinger said you need an external supply of energy. That's what he said, you have eat, you know, as Strodinger said, you, well, where does metabolism, you can eat, right? You can, that's what he mean. You need an external source of energy. Prigogine said you must have another linearity. Which they are all correct, by the way. You need nothing there, otherwise nothing is going to happen. Then more regular might say, you need not only energy and nonlinearity, but you need to be able to amplify small fluctuations. So German gets closer to the other two, but none of them really understood what is necessary because I will give you an example. But well, I will give you all these three conditions. First, I will give you battery. You can have any battery, number of batteries you want. I will give you a PN junction diode, which is a nonlinear device, a rectifier. So you have the nonlinearity, so it satisfies Prigogini. And I will give you a transformer. A transformer, so all you know, if you put in 110 volts outside, you can get 220 volts outside. So you can it amplifies from 110 to 220. So you amplify, okay? And yet, you can, I can give you all of this element, and you can allow you to connect it any way you want it, and you will see there is no pattern. You will see that if this is a three-dimensional structure, interconnection of this element, you will have nothing, not, uh, uh, no pattern at all. They'll be identical. So therefore, those three conditions that Frodinger, Prigogini, and Germans uh, mentioned are not the real condition. They are consequences. Now I can also go to mechanical system. I can give you all any number of uh, pulley you want, and so you can have a lot of a gain. You can, you can amplify force, okay? But again, you will never be able to produce a system, a mechanical system, that has complexity. So the question really goes on the following. When Gelman said you must amplify fluctuation, the question is, what do you amplify? Do you amplify the position, the voltage, like the transformer, the velocity, the pressure, temperature, chemical concentration, or electrical current? What, what, what do you have to amplify to qualify for complexity? As German had suggested. And the answer is none of the above. You, you can be able to amplify any one of those and it will still have no complexity. So, what is the correct one? Well, this is the new theory that I have developed, that I have developed called the local activity. The local activity principle asserts that the correct physical variable whose amplification is essential for complexity to emerge is energy. So it's not voltage, it's not velocity, it's not position, it's energy. You must be able to amplify small fluctuations in energy. 
And so, I now have the definition. After all, I have complained about things with no definition, so I better give you definition. So what is local activity? Any system is said to be locally active, if and only if it is capable of amplifying infinitesimally small fractions in energy. German would have been correct if he had added this word in energy, but he did because he didn't know what it is. We now know that any of those examples that you have, you have parties, you must be able to amplify energy. So local activity, as I now define it, implies the three conditions that Prigogini, Frodinger, and Gelman say, meaning that you must have a source of energy and you must have a non-linear amplification. So they are all correct, except that it is only necessary. It doesn't go the other way. You can have all of these three, as I show you, and yet it, can, it is not locally active. And if it is not locally active, there is no complexity. There will be no patterns. And as I say, and I will develop the theory as uh, later on today, for just negative entropy is precisely local activity, and entropy chaos is just a special case of local activity. So you will learn two things new today. There is a very fundamental concept of local activity, and then a very special case of that, but the most important, it's called entropy chaos, which is the title of my talk. Because even though it is a special case, it is the most important. It is the most common. And this is published sometime in 2005. For those of you interested, the full theory, or rather I have a, a sketch of how to prove this. It says, local activity is the origin of complexity. And for this conference, it is very relevant. After all, the word complexity is the name of the conference. And if you stop, read my paper, you will find out the universe of all shares or units or uh, agents or whatever that you put together to form a system can only be of one or two things. Either it is locally passive or locally active. There are only two things. Everything. And only if you are locally active will there be complexity. Okay? And I have defined, of course, local active in it uh, in already earlier, but I have to be more precise, of course, get upon. Now, to be more precise, we can think of an electrical device with two wires coming out for simplicity, but there's nothing to do with electrical uh, component. I'll just, just give an example. And so, because if you have two wires coming out, you can apply a voltage, V of P, and you can measure the current, I of T. You can apply any voltage you wish on any current you are one, and you can measure the other one, which is the, if you apply the current, you measure the voltage. But it is the product that is power, and you want the, the energy, so you must integrate the power. So you integrate that, and to be locally active means technically the following, because to prove a theorem, you must have precise definition. And the definition simply says, you must be able, if you are giving, give me a candidate, you say, is this locally active? Is this, this is special locally active? You have two words coming out and say, well, I put in a battery here, put it, or any battery, and I measure the current, or put in any current, measure the voltage, and I multiply the two, I can integrate them, I can find up energy. And to be locally active technically means the following, that you should be able to find one, just one, find one voltage input or one current. You know, there are infinitely many possible voltages that you can generate or infinitely many current you can generate, but all I want, all I need to be looking at is you find me one. One waveform, voltage or one current, and then you measure the other one and then integrate them and it must be zero after some finite time. If you can do that, then it is locally active. And so, for example, in most cases, when things are not locally active, you typically apply a current waveform, and you measure the voltage waveform, and then you, you multiply the two, you get a power, and you integrate, 
Now, in general, what you will find out that the integral is the energy dissipated, then the energy is always positive. This is not locally active. To be locally active, you have to be able to show me that that device that you are trying to test, that you can find a way for, such as the next example. Let's say if I pick this waveform and I measure, if this is the current, I measure the voltage, this other one, and I multiply them and integrate. Now, in, initially, the power is, is, is always energy is positive, so it is better, but at some point, finite time, the energy becomes negative. Bingo. Once you have that, you have proved local activity. So, so local activity is not just a definition, it is something precise, something you can prove. But the difficulty is, how do you, first of all, how do you know this device is locally active? And even if it's something that it is, how do you find one example where this will come negative? That is the challenge. Because there are infinitely many waveforms. So if you have tried, say, 500 of them, and every time you found it's not, never negative, it doesn't mean that it is not locally active because it's infinitely many, you just haven't tried enough yet. So clearly, this definition is not good enough to test. It's a good definition, it's a precise definition, but it's not testable. And we need a theory. The good news is I have a theory. I have developed a theorem which tells you how to test, which tells you that you don't have to find this. You just have to look at my theory and if the theory say yes, it is local active, then you can be guaranteed that there is such a signal, even though you haven't found it yet. And that is the foundation of local activity and edge of chaos and therefore complexity. Now the physical meaning of locally active cells is after all when you amplify energy, to be low active, obviously you have to, somebody has to pay for it. I told my student there is no free lunch, okay? So to be locally active means you have to be able to amplify energy, but it means that you have to be supplied with energy somewhere else, like a battery. A battery has a lot of energy, but it has no information. So local activity essentially converts useless battery in, in, uh, with no information into some amplification of that that has energy, that has, that has information. So, the physical meaning of local tip says that one can use a local amplifier to amplify small signal at the expense of an external power supply. So, for example, neurons in our brain maintain their local levels of organization by burning glucose. In fact, every living cell is a molecular amplifier. And as I said, the good news here is that local activity is testable. It is a rigorously defined mathematical property which can be tested by examining the location of the poles of an associated function that I call complexity function that I have been defined shortly. So it's something very familiar uh, to most of you. All of you know what poles and zeros are. And it, the good news is you can test for local for complexity, or rather local activity, by just looking at whether you have pole or a certain position. Now the local activity principle now says that no interaction among dynamical cells in a non-conservative system can give rise to multiple static and or spatial temporal patterns or structures, unless either the cells or the couplings is locally active. So this is just a very general summation of what I've just said, that if you want to have any complexity at all, you must, the cell must be locally active. All the complex must be locally active. Now, what is very important here is, local activity is not the same concept as it's instability, because most people are confused, and that's why there was no progress, because people are already confused with something that becomes unstable. Where local activity is different, concept from, from instability, although they are very much related. And then, what is the edge of chaos? Edge of chaos, as I said, is a special case of local activity. But an uncoupled cell is said to be on the edge of chaos, if and only if it is 
locally I get myself to ask them to go stay more in political point. It means that you can be locally, you see that different way to be locally and one way is the obvious way, they think we close up and and and, and, and explore that it's a cosmogly happy. But the really deep phenomenon that we discussed earlier is something that on the surface it looks dead. Like like the, the example earlier that they read them. You, you get a simple black box and you see everything goes to a constant. Nothing seems interesting until you put in some dissipation. Very content, when suddenly things blow up. Well, that is the edge of chaos. So, edge of chaos, first of all, has to be locally active, but it is a deeper kind of local activity. So, now coming back to this picture of the universe of all devices are either locally passive or locally active, but within the local activity, local active region, there is a subset, typically a very small subset. That's what makes it interesting. A very small subject, and unless you know you that then you have a theory, you will never understand. And that subject is called the edge of chaos, which is the subject of my talk today. And edge of chaos, on the other hand, is not the same concept of stability because you say it's, it's stable, and yet why why it does it become unstable when you make things make it even more dissipated? So we come back to this reader now, the time to tell you this, the, uh, the answer to my reader. This two, this black box is just a resistor in series for the inductor, except they're both negative. Minus two ohm and minus two Henry. And if you easily check, you can calculate uh, for the you can, you can now calculate for the admittance of this very simple circuit and you can see that the admittance is just 1 over uh, the, the, the sum of these two impedances and it is equal to minus 1 over 2 plus s plus 1 s is the complex variable so you can see the pole is at minus 1 it is stable completely stable okay and yet what happened Oh, but what's something very interesting? What makes it as appears in the next property, which is going to be really our main theory later on? If you look at this admittance and then SPI omega, look, let let the sign is a frequency. So, so this is minus one over two plus one plus i omega, one plus i omega, and then it's a complex number. So you separate it to real and imaginary part. The interesting thing about this is the, in the real part. Remember, it is the real part of the admittance, which is minus 1 over 2 plus 1 plus omega. And of course, because this is for all past the frequencies, for, for all past the frequencies, this is negative. The real part is negative at some frequency. All you need, to, and the theorem that will come out later about H scale, is that all you need is that the real part should be negative at some frequency. Here is a trivial example, it happens to be negative everywhere, but that's not needed. All you have to do is that it be negative at some frequency. Which is similar to say find, finding out the millions and billions of wave for find one that will give you negative energy. This is the equivalent of that. But this is something you can understand. All of you can remember this circuit, go home and check it. It's stable, but the real part is negative. Okay, now see what happened. I'm gonna put in this four ohm resistor in series. Normally your intuition says four ohm resistor is making more dissipated, things should be even more stable. But because there is a negative two ohm here, so if you add plus four, this becomes S minus one instead of S plus one. So that the pole now becomes in the right half plane. You have made this circuit unstable by adding dissipation. Totally counterintuitive. This is why people do not understand complexity. Okay? It is totally counterintuitive. But that is the theory. This is the correct theory. And I say that the proof of, of uh, the basic proof is in my paper of 19 of 2005. And the proof just to tell you it's not trivial. 
requires a non-trivial application of the following mathematical resource. Uh, you need to apply nonlinear model to an operator in function space. You need high dimension analog of the mean value theorem. You need Lassar's complete stability theorem. You need partial change in the half plane. You need theory of partial variable on a complex variable. And you need Perkins theory. At least six totally unrelated topics to prove this theory. So it is not trivial. Okay. All right. But the, but the good news is how to test is trivial. All you have to do is just look for the, the real part of the complexity function and find out whether it is negative at some frequency. Okay, now uh, let me go on. Let me just see my time here. Let's now go to be more specific. So complexity emerges from dynamic phenomena involving infinitesimal small values of the state variable. That's it. basically what's interesting. You remember that Schrodinger and, 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 and Prigogine said you must have nonlinearity. And in, indeed, in general, you need something that's nonlinear and quite strongly nonlinear. Not small, but very strong nonlinear. And yet, the miracle here is this local TBE is a phenomenon that is infinitesimally small, which is totally counterintuitive. And yet, the reason this work is, is mathematic. Because we have a, a, a nonlinear that's a function that is uh, analytical, you can have local behavior that propagates global. That's basically what it is. So now let me get technical now. So start with dynamical system. A dynamic system is generally understood by most people to be uh, something that has an input u and output y. This can be both vectors, but today it's a vector of, of scalars. Now the input output is related by the output is some nonlinear function of the input plus a state variable. A state variable is something that has the dynamics. And therefore it is it has to obey a differential equation. So a dynamic system therefore is defined in general by any 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 uh, reasonable person to be by this defined by these two equations. A differential equation and a and a map. Okay, now what is interesting is as I said this is in general very nonlinear. But what makes it locally active is to look at a, a, a specific operating point and look around it in infinitesimal and see what happens. And so it means that we look at the equilibrium. Equilibrium meaning setting x that equal to zero. If you set x that equal to zero, you can solve the for x as a function of e for u, and then you can plug it in here, and when you do that, you have what electrical engineers, I know most of you here are not electrical engineers, but this is still strictly side, uh, simple mathematics. You, at equilibrium, you set the differential variable dx dt equal to zero, solve for x as a function of u, and then plug it in here, and you have a function, uh, a nonlinear that relates the output to the input at equilibrium. And in electric engineering, we call that DC. DC means the recurrent. So therefore, from the dynamic system, you have a well-defined DC characteristic. And once you have a DC characteristic, every point is a possible operating point. And now we can say we bias it. But for today's audience, it's just that we pick any one point on the DC. It look at one equilibrium point. And then you can apply parallel series, linearize the equation, so that this becomes, from instead of nonlinear, become linearized about any such equilibrium point. And so in vector form, they become, these are all matrices that are linearized behavior. And you can now plug in the, the you can solve for x, you see the derivative becomes the Laplace transform, so because you get rid of the derivative, it's now algebra, you can solve for x. And then plug it in here, and the whole thing will you can relate the output y small signal now. 
in perturbed about the equilibrium point, the output is just h of s times the u as a function of frequency s. And this function, h of s sometimes is called a system function or transfer function in engineering. But it's not important today. What is important today is that you have relate the, relate the output to the input via a complex function about an equilibrium point. And now, the real secret of edge of chaos and rogue activity is the following. That's the conjugate transpose of that. And in a scalar, if this were a scalar, then of course the conjugate transpose is just the conjugate. And then you have a complex number plus this conjugate. It is the real part. So you can see now where the word why real part. In the very trivial spatial case, the com this complexity value is the real part of the system function. And that reader that I show you is precisely that. It is so trivial, it's a scalar, and it is the real part. So, to summarize what I've just shown you, that for any system you are testing for complexity, you look, you pick up one cell and say, is that cell locally active? Or if it is locally, is it on the edge of chaos? You do that by deriving the complexity function, which is the transfer function plus its transpose conjugate, or people call it the Hermitian form. If you were a mathematician, you look for the Hermitian form, and you want to find whether there is some frequency when the Hermitian form, or when it is scalar, just a real number, becomes the real part. Whether that real part can be negative. It is precisely that reader that I just showed you earlier. Okay, so we now have a formal theory and we have a theorem that tells you how to test. There is a simple geometrical interpretation of the audit, by the way. It simply means that the surface around the equilibrium is not something that has a valley or is not a peak of a mountain. It is it's like a southern, like the whole southern. That's what S of chaos means. Got to be a sudden. So once you understood enough mathematics, this is what you can prove, what it means. Okay, so let me now move on to tell you that <coughs> after going through all this mathematics, which as I again emphasize because I don't want to mislead you that it is not trivial, but after you did that all that homework, you can prove that edge of chaos implies local activity. In other words, even though edge of chaos is a very small region, if you can prove that your uh, cell is sitting on an edge of chaos, you have proved you have local activity. And summarize one more time, edge of chaos and local activity are small signal phenomena and can be easily tested from linearized system function edge about the equilibrium point. Okay, now I have built up the machinery the, the tell you that there is a fundamental theorem that you can prove and that the good news is that you can test it. Uh, a junior electrical like engineering student can, can do it. So it's that simple. Now I'm ready to go back to the real world to show you some interesting examples. So let's begin with a uh, in nature published 2000 is one of the important papers in this issue of nature. It's about gastrulation. Unless you are a biologist, I do not expect you to know what does the word gastrulation mean. But you will. Now, remember it and you will never forget it. Because you have come from gastrulation, like me. All of us come from our mother's egg being fertilized, and once it's fertilized, it will be divided into two, and then it's into four and eight cells, and after a short while, it gets into a balloon-like thing, and that balloon is what I show you, is called a blastula. So blastulation is just the process of this going through these stages, from uh, our mother egg being fertilized, and in the early stage, uh, get into this blastula. Now if you look, this is just a ball, this is just a and if you look under the microscope, look at every cell, you will see they're completely identical. There's absolutely no difference. So therefore, 
The obvious conclusion is that this is going to be a ball, okay? But interestingly enough, for those of you who are religious, uh, a certain point, God comes in and poke his finger out and touch the ball, and that ball will be destabilized. This is the section of that, and that process of God or whoever did that begin the process where you and I come from very quickly. This becomes the intestine, the guts, and all the organs will develop from there. This is gastrulation, this process. Okay, and you and I have come from that process. Okay, gastrulation, therefore, is the dynamic evolution process from a perfectly symmetrical blastula into a non-symmetrical embryo. That's what I've just shown you. And if, if you are religious, you will absolutely say this is obviously God who has can perform this mirror. Okay? And I will tell you, of course, there is no mirror, but this is all local activity and it's a pills. And gastrulation, in fact, according to Sir Lewis Walker, a very famous British biologist, and so uh, Lewis Walker said in one, in one of his famous books, it is not your birth, even though your birthday, of course, is important, your marriage, or even your death. But gastrulation is a truly important event of our life. And the reason is, we all understood birth, marriage, and death. Nobody understood gastrulation. And this is, therefore, to emphasize that how, in spite of fact, that this, we all got to it, we don't, nobody knows why. So, clever people like Alan Turing, who is the father of the digital computers, as most of you know, uh, but many of most of you probably did not know that Turing also made published a very influential paper in the 50s. And Turing was precisely bothered by this gastrulation phenomenon. He said, like most serious people, why how can that happen? You know the board to every cell is identical. Why should something happen and change it? And he published this very influential paper, 1952, called the chemical basis of molecular chemistry. <coughs> And I just come here. An embryo in its spherical blastula stage has spherical symmetry, but a system which has spherical symmetry and whose state is changing because of chemical reaction and diffusion will remain spherical, symmetrical forever. It certainly cannot result in an organism such as a horse, which is not spherical symmetrical. Yeah. And so Turing raised a question important question, uh, how can this happen? So he decided to say, well, I am a mathematician, therefore, I should be able to find an abstract mathematical equation that shows that uh, in the in an abstract sense, this can happen, because before Turing, nobody, that's why Walker said this is the most important event, not your birth or marriage, because no one understood. So Turing said, I will try to understand that. He is, of course, a very clever mathematician. So he said, okay, he would pick a reaction diffusion equation. A reaction diffusion equation is something that looks like this. It has a partial derivative of the state variable V. V is what any one of these variables. It's called a kinetic term. This is where the chemical, the molecule interact. And then you have a diffusion. This is the Laplacian. So, he, he looked at, he said, let me look at reaction diffusion equation because this is the most well understood in his time. And even today, most people understood reaction diffusion equation more than anything else. Reaction diffusion systems are used as models in population dynamics, in genetics, in nerve conduction, in epidemiology, in combustion, as well as purely chemical systems. So Turing said, okay, I will find a simple example, so simple that if I'm right, I will be able to understand what's going on. So he picked this example, only two cells. He said, you don't need a million cells, you only need two, okay? Identical. So if you have two identical cells and they're coupled by diffusion, 
In Twitter, you say, of course, everything will be the same. They have identical, everything identical. So you say the same solution. And if he can prove that they have different solutions, then he achieved his purpose. So therefore, he cleverly assumed there are two molecules, X and Y, and there are two cells. So X1, Y1 are the two molecules in the left cell, and X2, Y2 are the two molecules in the right cell. And so he said, and that's the clever form. Turing play around with the numbers of this kinetics. So he said that X1 and Y1 obeys the kinetic differential equation like so. No one knows how Turing came up with this number. And obviously, of course, he did it by trial and error. But trial and error is not fair to him because he had to have deep insight. Because if you do not have a deep insight, just play around with numbers, especially in this time there were no computers. It would take forever. But he did it, he, he got it right. But what's important, of course, is he got it right. But he did not know why he got it right. He said, got it right. And today we will see he got it right because of my theory. Okay? In other words, if you use my theorem, the number will come out. Okay? And so, so he said, it has this reaction equation, and then it has diffusion. Diffusion in physics, most of you who are the thing in real life, diffusion is a dissipated phenomenon. It's like a resistor. It would, it would just tend to make things uh, less violent. Like this fall off resistor. Make it more violent, yet it becomes, uh, uh, contrary, it becomes active. This is what he's trying to say. So, this is the first equation for the left cell, and then the right cell is exactly the same. You just change the subframe from one to two because the whole point is that they are, have to be identical. And Turing was able to show the following, which is a very clever idea in his time. Even in today's time, most people still do not know why. Until you know my, my theory. And this is the non-trivial part. You look at this is what Turing said. You, you put this in, in matrix form, a four equation, so you have four by four matrix. The, the left part will be this 4 by 4 matrix, x1, y1, x2, y2. And then this is just the diffusion term. This is the Laplacian. This is a term that produces the dumping because it's dissipating. Okay, so Turing say, let's look at the eigenvalues of this matrix. And he found that the eigenvalues of this matrix G1 are all negative. Which means everything goes to a constant, like by example, everything that I both ask him to go to exponential and zero, I mean to a constant. So his first example fits exactly by example. And then he said, the, this is the dissipation, so the eigenvalues at most can be zero, and of course it is minus nine, minus one, zero. So, so there's nothing positive here to make it worse, it will just down this thing out. Now remember the right hand side is the same. So Turing said, let's just put them together, add them together. So this is the new matrix that adding these two. So you have in summary two matrices that are both stable. Both of them just go to constant. And so they all have negative eigenvalues or zero. And the amazing thing is, and most of you probably would not believe it, but I will tell you this is possible. You take two stable matrices with negative or zero eigenvalue, put it together, you get this matrix, and Turing showed that this matrix has a positive eigenvalue. That is shocking. Most mathematicians, in fact, even today, they do not know, would not believe it. That is the big result. Turing, great insight, has shown that possible. But of course, he doesn't know why. All he cares is to show that it is possible. He doesn't know how, I mean, he never wrote in the paper how he picked this number. But obviously he picked it by trial and error and insight, because if he had a theory, he would have published that. And the theory had to wait till my theorem here. Okay? If you use my theory, it will tell you how to pick this number, so that you would have this property. Okay, so, therefore, Turing is the first person to prove that complexity is possible. And my question is, what special property must G1, the first matrix, possess to make these stabilization possible? How? Not if you take all, any ordinary matrix and it has negative 
value. This is not what happened. It's a very, very special situation. You have to be very clever and lucky, as touring is, which I'm sure is very clever, to find a certain example that, that make it possible to be stabilized. And the secret here, as I said, this has negative eigenvalue. But if you look at this matrix, it has all negative eigenvalue. The secret is, if you look at the symmetric part of that, the symmetric part just the matrix plus the transpose. And if you take the symmetric part of that, you now see that obvious, completely obvious that you have a diagonal matrix in this case, you have a positive number. You have a positive and a negative eigenvalue. And so this is really the, the secret. It is not it is not the eigenvalue that most people thought uh, of a function that is important. It is the eigenvalue of the symmetric part. And that is the secret. And that is the case of case. So, summarize, the fundamental concept of complexity is that the symmetric solution of a homogeneous system of stable cells can become unstable even under dissipated coupling if the cells are locally active. Now remember here, this is completely not trivial because the cells are stable, like the first circuit. You know, uh, they have absolutely no reason to doubt that it has, uh, is any different from any other cell. And yet, after putting in with dissipation, it suddenly becomes unstable. This is the concept of edge of chaos. It is a central concept of complexity for those of you who, un who want to understand complexity. Local activity destabilizes the homogeneous part. Okay, now the question is how do you know? I, I told you earlier that, there, that I have been wrong. You cannot, you cannot even if you're the luckiest person come up with a function, a waveform that will uh, produce a negative energy and say it's normal active, it's just impossible. It is just uh, like fishing a needle from a haystack. But I have a theory, I told you, I promise you, and that theory is the following, a local activity theory. And that local activity theory says that you look at the impedance function, or, or in general, I call it complexity function, and there are four different ways for a candidate cell to be locally active. There are four candidates. I don't want to go, I don't want to go through all of them, but what I will tell you is the important one is the fourth one. You can see the fourth one says the real part of this complexity function must be negative at some frequency. In other words, there are four ways to be locally active. The first three ways are quite obvious, not important, and not very common. It is the fourth way that is very uncommon. I mean, that's very common, but it's not un understood. And, and that fourth way is the edge of chaos. So the symmetric solution of homogeneous system can, can become unstable, as I already said, just repeated, under dissipated coupling, and touring Turing's instability via dissipation phenomena therefore originates from local activity. So that's one important part of my talk today. To summarize, you have this very famous mathematician, the father of computer science, Alan Turing, who published one paper, only one out of, he's a mathematician, but he published one influential paper called Morphogenesis that show it is possible. Uh, to have complexity. And now, about 20 years later, came another famous mathematician, a colleague of mine from Berkeley, Professor Stephen Smell. And since the other part of the conference on chaos, he's the father of chaos, uh, a mathematical chaos at least, because Lorenz is just uh, uh, with an equation, but there is none deep at all. It is Smell that, produced, that provided the mathematical proof that chaos is possible. Before Smear, in spite of Lorraine, nobody can really uh, uh, agree 
that 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 makes that is true. So smell is a very deep mathematician, and like Turing, he was fascinated by complexity. And like Turing, he said, "I'm going to do better," because all Turing did is to show that example. Basically, the example saying that you can have stable cells coupled them by display, make it unstable. That's all Turing did with this famous paper. But he didn't give any real examples, uh, and he didn't give any proof, mathematical proof. But smell was, of course, uh, this is 50s, smell this is the 70s, 30 years later, and a lot more advanced mathematics. And he, but he used the same system. He said, let me pick only two cells, like Turing. Except that he said, I'm going to make a cell a little bit more complicated, so that he can also have an equation. So that he can actually play with the equation. Uh, and he was able to show that not only, not only like Turing showed that he can unstable, uh, because all Turing says that it can be unstable, therefore you can have a pattern. But a pattern is something that normally is, is, a, is a, doesn't move with time. So it's just like hexagon and different pattern. But Smith was able to show that not only you can have pattern, but you can have oscillation. Those cells that, that you have thought are dead, suddenly uh, smell called the Israel was alive. So let me quote, this is from Smell. He said, it is, he's talking about his model now, Smell said, it is a model for two similar cells which interact via a fusion as a membrane. Each cell by itself is inert or dead in the sense that the concentrations of the enzymes achieve a constant equilibrium. Concentration by the other, X1 and Y1 in total. Okay? And but he said that in interaction, however, the cellular system horses or express perhaps over grammatically becomes alive. In the sense that the concentration of the enzyme in the cell will oscillate indefinitely. So Sperr published paper in 1974, 20 some years after 1952, and proved that not only you can have pattern, but you can have oscillation. And about 20 years later, some researchers showed that using uh, this chaotic circuit I developed, uh, if you use those as a cell, not only you can have oscillation, but you can have chaos. You can, you can, you can take the, the trust circuit to the parameter so that it, it is not oscillating. It's not chaotic, it's dead. According to use the word of spell. The cell is dead, the trust circuit is dead because the parameter can change so that it, 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 it is unavailable. And you take two of them and you couple them by diffusion, suddenly it not, not only oscillates, it becomes chaotic. So this is Therefore, a specific example, but higher, um, more advanced in, in theory. So Smear has a paradox. He said that there is a paradoxical aspect, I'm copying this from, from his paper, okay? Smear say there is a paradoxical aspect to the example. One has two dead, and he said master one guy dead, of course, says, interacting by a diffusion process, which has a tendency in itself to equalize the concentrations. Yet in interaction, a state continues to pulse indefinitely. The word pulse means oscillate. Now, of course, he would have not be happy to know that not only it pulses, but it, and it can become chaotic as well, which is even more exciting. And again, Smell produced an example and he proved it, but he doesn't know why. He, he has no idea what is done. So, this is the word here, according to them, poses a short problem, namely to axiomatize the properties necessary to bring out oscillation and diffusion. In other words, smell was frustrated. He, he said, I can prove that it's chaotic, I mean, I can, can be oscillating, but, but why? He said, find me the axiom that would do it. And of course, he, he didn't know it, otherwise he would have produced that. He, in fact, he was so pessimistic. That in the end of his paper, Smear said, any sort 
of systematic understanding all analysis seems far away. Before one can expect any general understanding, many examples will have to be thought through, both on the mathematical side and the experimental side. That was 1974. We now know why, and that's end of case. Okay? So you can appreciate why this is a very fundamental result I'm presenting to you today. We got people like Turing and Spell that could not understand why. And now I have the solution. The solution to Spell's paradox, a mass market mechanism responsible for converting a stable dead cell into an oscillating light cell is precisely the edge of chaos. And now we can go back to Brigogini. Brigogini, remember in the earliest slide show that he said, shall we call this the instability of the homogeneous? Because he doesn't know why. He said, let's invent a name. His name is the instability of the homogeneous. Now I can tell you the theory to answer to him. It is always possible to destabilize the homogeneous solution of the reaction diffusion equation with one diffusion coefficient. If this compression function as a real part of this negative <coughs> at just one value of omega, you don't have more, you know, just one is enough. Our example was too general, so it's everywhere. So the edge of chaos theorem can be summarized in some sense. In other words, this is, there are many ways to, to say that you have here on the edge of chaos. These are sufficient conditions. One of this is easy to understand, so I'll give it to you. A CNN cell, I mean a cell, forget about CNN, uh, is on the edge of chaos if all poles of Z of S are in the left half plane, means it's stable, and at least one zero is in the right half plane. Something very easy to check. It is a sufficient, it's not necessary for all edge of chaos, but it is a very easy check. Because all you have to do is look at the poles and zero. If the poles are on the left hand plane, and if all one is the right hand plane, and the zero, you have you are on the edge of chaos. You are on the edge of chaos because the poles are in the left hand plane is stable. But you have one zero on the right hand plane. That zero on the right hand plane is what gives you the real part that is negative. Okay. Now with this theory, uh, it means that if you want to have pattern, if you want complexity, all you need to do is issue your cells out of on the edge of chaos, all locally active, all the coupling is on the edge of chaos. And so we have produced an example of a, of a bucket ball, like a soccer ball, okay? And, uh, and, and we show that if you make the coupling not locally active, you have, as you expect, a uniform solution, all green. The green color is uniform. There is no complexity. But by tuning these parameters, because I have a theory, all I need to do is to move one to zero to the right hand plane and keep the point in the left hand by, by searching this number. And I was able to produce a bucket board that have different colors. So this is you can say an obstruction of the gas relation that I just showed you earlier. And similarly you can take a uh, second again and uh, show you only one, but this, but this is much of a grid of resistors. So these are all dissipated coupling. In fact, that's exactly the diffusion. So you have, you have a, an array of identical short circuits. Every one of them is stable and with poly level plane. And you couple them by the diffusion. And you can ask, what do you see? This is what one thing you can see. You have a wave. So not only you have a pattern that's, that, is, that is static, but you now have something that is moving. And moving in a very attractive way, there are spirals, moving spirals. Now you can use the same thing and go to three dimension. Now you have a three dimensions array of short circuit. Every dot here is a short circuit. And then you couple them by two grids. One, this node, and the other, that node. 
So you know in three dimensions and you ask what you see. Because it is in the on the edge of chaos, you can see for example, not just a uniform color cube, but patterns like that. And you can see dynamic patterns like that. These are called wave, a uh, scroll wave. And, and earlier the wave, this is a two-dimensional wave, so it is quite uh, simple. This is a three-dimensional wave. These are called scroll waves. And this is a phenomenon that unfortunately you and I can go through when we finally go to rest. That's when your heart stops beating. Just before that happens, this is what you will see, a scroll wave. And so uh, let me now move on to tell you that with this theory, you can predict complexity in a reverse way and not not just say this is an example uh, not like philosophers you have not undergone but real substance so most of you know about the Fitzhugh Nagumo equation this is an example of Fitzhugh Nagumo equation that is widely studied and it, they couple them by diffusion <coughs> one diffusion and applying my theory of it's a chaos and no activity. We were able to find that the, the red pattern is where these, these are parameters. So we have A, B, A, B, C, epsilon. And of course, I can show three dimensional ones. So I fix uh, A and I show you B, C, epsilon. And I, using my theory, you can develop find what parameter will it be locally active. And the red region are the locally active region. And now you ask where are the regions that are on the edge of chaos? And the, this is the picture. Edge of chaos are the red region. And as expected, the local active region is the green region, is, is so large that really it's not so interesting because if you are down here, Things are always unstable, things blowing up. It's not exciting. The exciting thing are those that you are just very dead and they suddenly become alive. And those phenomena are found all along this tiny edge of chaos region. And in fact, the most are found about this region. So, so this gives you a feeling that complexity arises when you are very close or all already on the edge of chaos. And this is something that has been borne out with many examples that I have no time to talk about. In fact, I can project back about 50 million, 500 million years ago, all we know about the Cumbrian explosion, for example. Now this line is not real. This is now a conjecture. Yeah. But nobody knows why at that point in time, suddenly, there is an explosion of species. You know, not just ten, 10 or new evolution, there are suddenly hundreds of thousands of new species just suddenly appear at that time. It's called, that's why it's called a Cambrian explosion. My conjecture is that you are sitting in a dynamic system so that you are almost exactly at this point, uh, an edge of chaos that is bordered by many other possibilities. And you can apply the same theory and you can show that the famous Michael Gilbert equation which shows how does a snail uh, generate this pattern. After all, the snail is, and now you remember the snail develop over time. So, so therefore, you, you can, the time axis is really also the development of the snail. But the snail can develop pattern like that. And this is called the Michael Gilbert equation. It's a perfect example of things on the edge of chaos. This is another example of a different pattern of the snail, and it is also completely predicted from the edge of chaos theory. This is yet another pattern of snail. All of this, even the most exciting one, the, the nautilus, you can show that all of them are on the edge of chaos. And again, let me summarize Cumbrian expression. 500 million years ago. Uh, unparalleled explosion of life, more than 50 major groups of organic animals suddenly. 
I conjecture that this is also a of chaos. This is the only thing I conjecture that everything else are rigorous, okay? All of the things that I show you, they are all days of chaos. So let me move on uh, to show you the same theory can be uh, understood now very easily. Pattern formation now uh, can now be thought of a homogeneous medium, can be interpreted as a result of a massively parallel dynamic array computation by what's called a cellular neural network, which is something that I invented some years ago, but you don't have to know it. It's a CNA, just that for cellular nonlinear network, it is just nothing but a coupling, local coupling of identical cells. And, but it is a very simple coupling and, and, and that you can build with electronic circuits. So, a CNA therefore is defined as any collection of locally active LNS or cell which interact with neighboring cells via prescribed laws uh, that we call the local rules. So, uh, for those of you who are not aware of CNA, is nothing but an array of every one of them is an electronic circuit, it's a cell. And the cell are coupled locally by numbers, by coefficients of coupling, and that is by a matrix. And that's all you need to know today is, is that they have this local coupling. And now what's interesting and amazing is the following. I am going to get a CNN where every cell interacts only uh, not only with its nearest neighbor, but the next nearest neighbor, so it's a 5 by 5 matrix of interaction. And then I'm going to keep them unchanged. I'm only going to change the, low, the one number, just one number out of 25. And I think you will be amazed to see what can happen. So I have now a CNN where I freeze the 24 number and I change only in central. So I will begin with 24.2, minus 24.2. And with, and then by the way, there's another parameter which is a, a constant that you can adjust. That constant is Z. Okay, so you have two, you have 25 number plus a constant. Forget about B for now. It's not important. Z is a constant you can adjust. So if you adjust 24 to 24.2 and then with a constant 1.2, you can show that you produce hexagonal spots. So I've shown you that hexagonal pattern like earlier uh, is very common. Uh, for example, this is the computer simulation of that. This is a hexagon. This is all made of, made of hexagon. Like the honey, honeycomb and the Sahara Desert. You know, these are all hexagons. But I've just shown you that it's not so much that it's Sahara or, or bees. They're totally unrelated. And, and so much important here that I want to show you is that when you see books talking about, about uh, uh, if, if the author is a chemist, you start to argue that because of this chemical reaction, you're going to get this such and such pattern, like sun pattern. And if you are a geologist, you will argue that well, because of the sun of certain shape, they is likely to have hexagonal pattern. And I will tell you that these are all wrong because I'm going to produce the same pattern with just mathematics. One, just one equation. I'm going to just change one number and I will show you I can produce all of this pattern to convince you that patterns should not be understood as the chemistry or the physics or the geology, but it is mathematics. Okay, now I'm going to reduce that number from 24 to 23.25. And when I do that, and from now on, all the Z will be zero, I change only that one number. The same, you know, it's the same circuit, same C, same C, same C. Now, this is a pattern that's called a synergetic, very famous pattern that if you were a physicist, you would have, most likely have seen this. This is the famous pattern from Professor Herman Hacken from Stuttgart. He had used uh, supercomputers to make very detailed calculation of the Navier stock equation and produce this pattern. Uh, I don't have to go into detail except that these are simulated by supercomputers. And of course that 
it is also the real. If you look at it experimentally, you will see the same thing. That's why it's important. But if he uses navigational and he uses supercomputer, very, very immense amount of computation. We now use this CNN that changes one number. It's 23.25, and we produce this example on the right side. And I think most of you will agree that they are almost identical. So you don't need a supercomputer. All you need is the understanding of the mathematics, and then it is quite trivial to produce this pattern. So you can think of this as stripes. So we now have shown with the same system, you can produce hexagons, and now you produce stripes. And now I change the number one a little bit more <coughs> to say, well, I'm in fact going to still stick with that, but I'm going to adjust constant. We have another constant that you can adjust. And that constant, as you adjust from zero to say one, and for the constant here, you will see there, these are like tiger. You look, so the skin. You know, this will be the, the skin of a tiger, you know. But if you massage that to a little bit to the right of the parameter, suddenly you get no power pattern. So you just understand now that it's no big deal that even to the search are identical. It is really just the mathematics of case of chaos where this pattern emerges as a consequence of the mathematics. <coughs> and now I'm going to come back to show you this interesting tiger, and right? most of you probably did not realize it. And I didn't realize it until I read it and then I have to go to a zoo and confirm myself. But you don't have to go to a zoo because I have a picture here. And may, not many of you know that the tail are made of horizontal stripes, unlike like this. You know, why, should it, why should it be not like that? Okay? And uh, for a long time I only cannot understand why. You know, why, why is that? After all, if you look under the microscope, the cells are identical. The cell that they tell is exactly the same cell that why should it have a different pattern? Well, it turned out that if you use the CNN, instead of a rectangular area, I pick a trapezoid. A trapezoid. And surely enough, it's exactly the same equation, just by changing the area that looks like a tail, it becomes spots like that, which is exactly what you just seen. This is a, a magnification. You see, this is the, what the tails look like. These are spots and, and stripes like that. So, again, if you do not know mathematics, this you will be so surprised. Why? And yet, it's the same equation. It's just changing the geometry. And here's another example. Go to, go to India, and you will see the desert. And you can see a whole bunch of these patterns here. And I, I will magnify one of them. Uh, it's not as clear, so I'm going to emphasize that. So this, so these are like tuning, tuning forms, okay? And you see those tuning form patterns uh, everywhere. For example, uh, in the zebras, uh, uh, zebra fish, angel fish, and in the in, in the zebra, you, you get this this opening, opening to the right or opening to the left. Uh, you know, this, this opening up, opening upward. So, uh, how does it happen? Again, these cells are all identical. Well, it turns out that it's same, exactly the same equation, the same parameter, except just changing a little bit to this number here. Minus 2300. Just, just changing point to something, you will get this tuning for button, which is almost identical to what I just shown you. And finally, I'm going to tune the parameter to minus 21.9 from 21, from 23 to minus 21.9. Still the same cell. And I was able to show, or we were, I, I, I am in my group, my research uh, colleagues, you were able to show that you start off with an uh, initial condition like that, and over time, it grows and grows, and and grow, and finally you end up with a dendrite, just like the dendrite, the snowflakes that I show you. But of course, you can say the snowflakes has much prettier, that's eight four symmetry. This is only four four symmetry, but that's not a big deal 
uh, but you have the important thing is that you can produce dendrites. And in fact, if you were so lucky to go to go to the Mars, where Mars is full of carbon dioxide, then snowflakes you are going to see in Mars is going to look like that. We just have it on the earth, we have the water, and, and so so that's not the important. The important thing is that you can generate dendrites by being locally active. Okay. Carbon dioxide knows the snowflake from Mars will exhibit a 4-4 symmetry, which you can look at the molecular structure of carbon dioxide. And finally, interesting, uh, talk about self-repair. Most of you probably uh, heard about that little tiny uh, animal called a, a, a uh, hydra. It's a small animal capable of self-repair. Because you cut off a hydra's head, a new head will be grown. You cut off a hydra's leg, and a new leg will be grown. And so, uh, for, I think I have given a, a slide here. Right. Anyway, it's, what's important is that's for self repair. And now I have the same against CNN, and I now change this number a little bit. So this is the stripes that you will, that, that is generated. Now I'm going to cut off the top of the, of the of the of the tissue, just like you are wounded, or just like you cut off a head. I'm going to I'm going to cut this cut this off. So they say this thing of that is worn. And sure enough, you look at the mathematics equation evolving over time for up to in fact only 220 iterations. This thing is repaired completely, like the original. This is self-repair. That is another manifestation of complexity. That uh, the edge of chaos is capable of self-repair. And in a way that you can understand because, because we have the mathematics. By the way, this is a picture I was looking for earlier. You have the, you have, you have the, the uh, uh, hydra on top. You cut it two pieces, the head and the tail. The head will grow back a tail, the tail will grow back a head. Okay? And I just demonstrate to you that, that uh, it's, not, it's easy to understand because we can produce this. To summarize, I have to show you that all of these patterns that people call complexity, uh, whether you are a geologist or chemist uh, or physicist, you should not try to understand it by looking at the physics or the chemistry because that's not the, the reason it came from. What it came from is just the mathematics. Well, because all of this example I show you, we define my family, this is from one mathematic equation from a CNN. And so the person that really understood this best turned out to be Galileo. Galileo said, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics, and nothing is clearer than here. Okay? So pattern and complexity is not magical. There is a simple explanation for that. You have to be on the edge of chaos. Now the last few slides I want to show you to summarize is that this is something very recent that I just uh, published. There are three unsolved problems from neurobiology. First is called the Huskin Huskin Spike Mystery. Now, Huskin Huskin, most of you of course knew, got the Nobel Prize for uh, the circuit that gets them the Nobel Prize. And that circuit is this one. And the miracle that they show is that with this circuit, you can produce action potentials or spikes. Uh, people call spikes. Now, Haskin actually uh, actually made a mistake by calling these two resistors time length resistors. But this will be another story that we call another time. It's not important for today. All you have to know today is that if you uh, understand local edge of chaos and local activity and you can you can take Huskin Huxley circuit and replace this by membristos, which is another device that I invented some years ago that I don't have to talk about. But the correct Huskin Huxley model should be membristos. 
But that's not the important thing. The important thing is, with that same equation, we're not modifying it. We're just saying that we give it the right interpretation. You will get this circuit, the small single circuit, and from that, you will produce the edge of chaos and everything, and predict everything that, that you will get this high action potential. So, so the, the uh, how can the second, the second, I said there are three unsolved problems. The, third, the, first, the first unsolved problem is how does the neuron generate action potential by Husky and Husky? And as I just say, you cannot understand that by uh, edge of chaos. They are all on the edge of chaos. Then, the second unsolved problem is Turing. You know, Turing, answer problem is how can a homogeneous assembly of identities exhibit non homogeneous structure? In spite of the fact that he gave us this beautiful example, he didn't know why, and we now know the answer is it's a chaos. Not as a philosophy or, or a hand waving, but it's solid, exact theory. And finally, the third unsolved problem is smash to itself because until today until i'm telling you this is remains unknown how can two mathematical dead cells interacting via this space become alive this is smell and uh, again the answer is they are the cells the two cells are poised on the edge of chaos they are all in this little region that makes all these wonderful things possible. So, edge of chaos is the solution of the three unsolved problems from neurobiology. And I'm going to conclude by saying that uh, The theory that I have just developed is completely general. And first we start by the, the converse. Any reaction diffusion equation which is locally passive at all cell equilibrium points cannot exhibit complexity, meaning it has no pattern. In the sense that it is it's steady state solution consists of only homogeneous patterns. So you've got to be locally active. And in particular, You've got to be on the edge of chaos. So if you are not, if you yourselves remember, uh, one way to think of a cell that are not locally active is the whole bunch of, this is a cartoon that I found somewhere. Everybody is going its way because none of them is locally active. But as soon as you, but if they are, in this example, on the edge of chaos. So by injecting them with the right parameter, with a coupling, all of a sudden, they are synchronous. Synchronization is a good example of where edge of chaos come into play. And mathematically, one way to think of this actually is something you can understand. Before this complexity happens, to be on the edge of chaos means that you're sitting at the bottom of a valley where you have only one place to go. Now, if you are locally at the particular edge of chaos, this become flattened out and eventually this can come out like this. So the sudden you have two. So as I said from one to two is all you need for complexity. And now you want to know that what is the part interpretation? Well it turns out that there are many ways to get local activity, many ways to get as of chaos. But the most common way is what I call positive feedback. If which is the mechanism for local activity. Positive feedback at the cell level or at the coupling level is a common route to local activity. And I will show you some example that you will understand. All of you, of course, most of you know about lasers. And the laser normally is, is not uh, lasing until you make it locally active. And, and the situation is about before it, it begins to produce the laser beam, you, are, you have a, let's say a monoponic curve like that. This is not locally active. But to make it locally active, this has to be at least tangential, so that in the next perturbation, you get an S-curve. 
And once you have that, you can see you have got to three solutions. And that is the beginning of the edge of chaos. So, uh, so this is the physical interpretation. The local activity brain is applicable also to non-physical problems. Now, so far, most of the examples are to do with physics, biology, or chemistry. But, you, but this same principle can be extrapolated. Although I cannot claim that it's rigorous anymore because I do not know the equation of economics. I do not know the equation of a, of a prison riot. But the same idea, though, I'm almost certain, can be translated into, for example, things like worldwide wave, economic system, or social system. And just to give you an example, why is the worldwide web in the age of chaos? Well, the worldwide web is fueled by what I call local interactions among cell users. So here's a picture of the worldwide web. And, and it looks uh, scary, but uh, you can ask why. Well, the reason you have passed the feedback in the local in the worldwide is because valuable or useful web pages tend to accumulate incoming links. And pages can become more valuable by linking to other valuable pages. And now you see this is the positive feedback. It is it, boomerang. So the positive feedback in a worldwide way comes from the circular influences that web page authors and users have on one another on taking action that are influenced by others. The passive feedback loop in the world wide web is what makes it locally active. And you can, by the same reasonings, imagine that riots during demonstrations are triggered by locally active interactions among the demonstrators. And what would even stress your imagination further by saying creativity is a manifestation of rock activity. Now I'm saying that these last things are all conjecture. They're not proof. Cannot be proved yet. Rock activity, then, in fact, I claim, is it as a root, the origin of gathers incomplete experience. Because there is this recursive thing in if you look at the Gilder theory, and that recursive thing is what gives you local activity. And of course, we know life is impossible without local activity. And I mentioned that even economics is, can be understood as local activity. And I have an interesting uh, slide here that uh, was trying to make the case here. Some but just last, uh, this is uh, in 2011, this is the economic, the, the economist. Most of you probably have seen uh, the, the, the economist with uh, you know, a very influential magazine. And in the, in, you know, because of the European Euro uh, that all of you are enjoying or suffering today, uh, uh, is continuing to be in the crisis. So this is the big cover, uh, economists say, on the edge. And now I say that if the author knew local activity, he should have said on the edge of chaos, because that's what it is. Economics situation we have today. So, so to be on the edge of chaos is not necessarily good. It is both good and bad, but ordinary are not green. Wait for a minute or two. The amazing thing is you will recall earlier when I have a coffee. And I put coffee, milk, and everything becomes all, all white. That's what you expect, that's second law of thermodynamics. But for Thea Maria, for whatever reason, you do the same experiment, after a few minutes, you see things like spaghetti. You have patterns. You, you really have patterns. And this is fun because then you not only you enjoy the cocktail, you understand something interesting happening. Question, what makes Tia Maria pattern, cream pattern possible? It is unexpected. And I invite you to go home and try that. It's, 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 a, it's a nice uh, experience. What makes it possible? And my last slide says, Tia Maria is poison, it's okay. <laughs>
Thank you. So many thanks for this beautiful uh, talk of uh, Professor Chua and then showing now the power of mathematics and that we are all believe in the power of mathematics. Are there some comments, questions or remarks or Are we happy to answer questions? <laughs> Any questions? There is one. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, we need a Well, uh, first of all, I have to thank you for your long and interesting lecture. Uh, and in spite of that, if you don't mind, I want to add another example for complexity. Another which example is to, about complexity, the complex, which is our life, our world. We are going for more complexity. We are going for more complex world. One example of that is our uh, environment to control the pollution. It is very simple to throw the waste everywhere. It, uh, opposite of that, we have to spend a lot of energy to control the pollution. So, uh, from the point of thermodynamic, it is a spontaneous action. And with time, it is a linear action. The problem is with the stability. This process is for uh, unstable, which is the opposite of the blame. And thank you. I'm not sure I understand what the question is. You're making a comment. Oh, oh you're making a comment. Okay, great. I, I thought you were asking a question. Everybody, you take your points where you take it. And uh, also, I would like to emphasize that I'm not claiming. The last part of my talks are just uh, conjectures. Those are, do not have any questions. You know, I talk about prison and riots, or economics, or all of this. These are uh, intuition based, guided by these many, many examples that have the foundation. And uh, that, that if you do not have low activity, things will be dark, life will come to be possible, you and I will be here. So whether it's, it's for good or for bad, something interesting happened, some explosion happened, these are all have to be locally active, okay? And then to the extent that uh, you're commenting the world development or whatever, uh, clearly there is some locally active agent there. Your job is to identify where is the agent and where does the local activity come from. Whether you want to suppress the local activity or you want to enhance it, depending whether you are the revolutionary or, or you are a politician. Uh, any other question? Yes? What's the concept of quality? We need a microphone. How the concept of quality behavior are related to the concept of global activity? What is that? Yeah. The, uh, the concept of quality behavior always is related to the global activity. Okay, you are asking what is the, the, the how is electrical activity with really local activity? I mean the collective behavior in a system. The collective behavior how the collective the collective collective, the collective behavior. behavior. Well the the, the the whole point about local activity is that it is the genesis of something like you have a single body, one point seven become double. Symmetry breaking. Symmetry breaking is what the physicists use today, uh, but they didn't understand what is the really cause of that. And the cause is local activity. With local activity, you are going to have this symmetry breaking. And if you have a thousand of cells all doing symmetry, you have billions of patterns that is possible. And then there's such thing called natural pattern that I don't have time to dis describe. Once you have many, many patterns, they are and like this cartoon I show you, suddenly people begin to, to synchronize. Then you, you, then you have the collective behavior. All of this can be understood. I just did a talk about it. Yeah. Uh, here's another. Uh, yes, in the, uh, there's another uh, person. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. You know, in the CNN, you would be moved. Uh, 
rectangle. And we showed how we how we go back. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was wondering, is there a critical shape which when we remove the structure will not be able to control itself? You were wondering whether to see it. Yeah, there like is a critical shape. They are critical which shape? A shape. Oh, you mean the the the, yeah, the you, background? You remove the rectangle. Yeah, but the, the it tail is a proper soil. Yeah, it looked kind of uh, synthetic compared to the actual structure. So I was wondering, is there a critical shape or a special type of shape which, when removed, the structure will not be able to grow back? Well, again, I'm sure. I'm sure that the the boundary and the shape of the substrate, which is going to affect the final pattern. And, and I mean, you have seen the example. The top soil gives you a tail that is totally different from the body. Okay, so so that part is clear. And again, it, it has to do with the natural. Uh, you know, in, in physics we have something called a natural frequency. Uh, here, where I call it the natural pattern, uh, and and. Depending on the interaction, the, the, the coupling, you are going to have different natural patterns. And that natural pattern will depend, in fact, not only on the coupling strain, but on the, the, the architecture, the substrate shape. And that's something that's going to happen. Yes. yes. Thank you. We need another, another microphone. Thank you. Uh, I believe uh, that in your presentation highlights uh, the contribution of the uh, Russian. Dynamician Lando. Uh, I think your presentation highlights the work of the uh, Dynamician Russian Lando about the explanation of vorticity. Uh, this work explains <coughs> vorticity in the fluid dynamics as uh, 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 an infinite number of uh, degree of liberty for our uh, half cell of fluid. Uh, my question is, uh, your explanation of CNN is the continuity of his legacy? Oh no. No, the, the CNN is just one example. It's, it, 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 I picked CNN because I'm uh, familiar with that. And, 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 and you know, if I can show you one example that will produce every pattern that I've shown today, and it's simple enough, you know, that's, that's good enough for my presentation today. But, uh, there, there is nothing special about my CNN. He can take any other collection of cells and just couple them and couple, couple them in the simplest way possible, but just be sure that the cell is not very active, especially uh, if it's on the edge of chaos. And all oh, at least the couple should be locally active. Then you are guaranteed. Uh, when I message what God did, you have very good chance of getting patent because this theory doesn't say you will go to get a patent. It says the opposite. It says if you do not have local activity, you will never have any patent. But it did not say that if you are local activity, you will get a patent. But it did say that if you do not have patent, you can massage, you get out of massage the problem, you are going to get patent. But that's what it says. I think there will be many, many questions. Maybe you, you may ask maybe after the, uh, the, the, the breaks or something with uh, Tantov. We probably try. I have some up, but I will talk with him. I think, I think it's. Uh, <laughs> I think we, we, we are we are very very thankful for this beautiful talk. Again, I think this was very nice, and it was recorded. I think that other people in Turkey now uh, learn about it and listen and enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you.